guys, it's May from Markets with May. And today we are going to talk about the asset management space and what I want to do during these kind of periods in between. I like to talk about kind of the industry overview and give people a lot of the jargon picture that maybe they don't get a regular chance to study up on or know about. But I would say that given what I'm reading currently on the asset managers as companies, it's clear to me that maybe a tutorial is in order. So we're going to do that today. And I'm actually going to talk about the whole space. What I would say that is in fairness, it is actually really hard to understand who the major players are in asset management and what it is they actually do and what the deal is. And even this tutorial is kind of like a basic landscape. I think that depending on what kind of layer you want to go into, you know, you could go as deep as you want. Now, let me give the disclosures. Past performance is not indicative of future returns. I think I may only have a residual amount of exposure remaining on Blackstone. Hey, James Harris. Um, and the only reason I think I, I lifted some of my positions. Now, I was positioned in Blackstone as a butterfly. I'm not going to tell you which strikes. But I lifted them because I actually realized reading a bunch of the articles this week that the fact that people are kind of weak on landscape of asset management is making the articles that come out sound a little cuckoo. So because I just kind of want to get out of the way of that, plus wait for the bank earnings to come out, uh, that's kind of where I sit. So let's get into it a little bit more. Um, and I really want to talk about uh, the reason that you kind of want to know, actually, let me take this off share for just a second. The reason you want to understand the asset managers is because the asset management space as a whole, big picture, is what you look at if you start to be worried about liquidity risk. And what you're really going to be looking for is, does anyone need their money back right away? OK, and I would argue that right now, not so much. But if we keep going at this rate, possibly. So let's actually show I want to show you where everybody sits. And we're going to start with the guys that probably have the least risk, but are the bulk of the asset management. Um, let me give you a little framework here, though, to start off. If you go to Investopedia, they're completely unhelpful as per usual. They'll say asset management is the practice of increasing total wealth over time by acquiring, maintaining and trading investments that have the potential to grow in value. Completely not helpful. Asset managing is really just managing assets. And typically, um, asset management, I will separate between asset management, asset ownership. Asset, asset ownership does not get fees for managing assets. Asset management gets fees for managing assets. In other words, somebody is giving them a bunch of money. They are going to take a fee for, for, for doing whatever it is for that set of money and so on and so forth. And some of that fee base is like just flat out, you gave me a hundred bucks. I'm taking 50 uh, half a basis, half a percent off of it or 50 basis points as with an ETF, or it'll be like, um, if this thing is up more than 10%, I'm going to get an extra cut. That would be a performance fee. But what a lot of people miss is asset managers are not big relative to the asset owners. And the asset owners is, is, is the biggest pool of capital. That's the biggest group of money. Asset, asset owners are, law, are sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, a ever so slightly a uh, small asset owner would be family office, private wealth. And then you have your private wealth from retail investors. They're third size on the totem pole. And those three own the assets. They do not charge themselves fees. They're the, the OG of where the money is. All right. And then the asset managers are all basically doing a set of activities to help the asset owners out. OK, let's go through that for a second. Um, I'm going to skip the next slide. There is another. OK, then there's this set of people, right? So the banks sit kind of not quite asset managers, but definitely a pool of capital. That, so the banks, venture related divisions or merger and acquisition related divisions of big companies also have a pool of capital that they reinvest into the marketplace and insurance companies. That's where all the money is. OK, now I'm not going to talk as much about these except in the Q&A to the extent that they're a concern, especially the banks are a concern. But realize that the money actually belongs to these guys, the asset owners, and then to a secondary extent, these guys. And then these guys do a series of tasks to it, not necessarily with the purpose of making large amounts of money. The banks are there to basically deal with your banking, and then they make interest rates off of that. They make fees off of that in some ways. 
A lot of banks, though, do have an asset manager and PNC, Truist, and very much so to a lesser extent, Comerica have tried to grow an asset management desk. But technically, the bulk of their money is coming off the banking business. That's why I put them there. And small regional banks would not have this business at all. Uh, you know, um, Silicon Valley Bank, it actually had a very unique type of asset manager attached to it. And then it also had an investment bank attached to it. So that's its own thing. Venture related divisions, they got a whole set of people that do that. And then insurance companies have an asset management arm inside, but they're going to be almost all fixed income. Okay. But th let's talk about what how things are. Sovereign Wealth Funds, this is the so global sovereignwealthfund.com website. They estimate about $11.4 billion in assets. What's that look like? Okay. These would be your top 10 sovereign wealth funds. 1.35 trillion is what we're talking about. These guys are not small pools of capital. And you can see what countries they lay out on. The U.S. doesn't have a sovereign wealth fund because we don't separate out the Treasury and the Fed that way. So we do it very differently. This is one gigantic pool of capital for each one of these guys to the tune of half a trillion dollars and up if you're in the top 10. It's a very big pool of assets. Their job is to um, basically make the country wealthy. And most of them have oil money. But some of them have other money from other ventures, like GIC, for example, it is a machine. And honestly, if you were like, hey, this this whole thing is really interesting. Where should I learn next? Learn from GIC. GIC is OG in so many ways. Before there was anything, there was there was the government of Singapore. Uh, so GIC Private Limited is the government of Singapore's sovereign wealth fund. All right. Next little piece of this that I just want to show you, sovereign wealth funds can sometimes give money to other sovereign to its own sovereign wealth funds. So Singapore actually has another oftentimes put in sovereign wealth, sometimes put in pension, but really it's a sovereign wealth fund, Tamasac. And Tam Tamasac is just is is only a little bit smaller than Singapore's um, than than GIC. So if you look at this list, you'll see Tamasac is number 8, GIC is um, 690 billion. And just so you know, like you can almost never get these things quoted because it's a timestamp, right? Like sometimes they're up, sometimes they're down. So just use these numbers because they're approximately correct from either from the last two years. So GIC gives money to Tamas, which is more asset management oriented. Um, it is like a very particular type of assets from GIC. But guess what? GIC also gives money like drug money. <laughs> Some of these stuff are so funny. You guys on the comments crack me up. I have focus though. But um, yeah, GIC gives money to a number of different organizations, including Singapore's Economic Development Fund, et cetera. Sovereign wealth funds oftentimes invest a huge component of the capital in businesses in the country for the purposes of growing those businesses. So that would be very normal. So them giving another big government organization like the Singapore Economic Development Bureau um, money so that they could then run conferences to bring in other small businesses to grow the VC business in Singapore. That's like classic 101 sovereign wealth and what they do. But like I said earlier, and hopefully this will continuously be more clear as I go through it, asset owners primarily ultimately allocate their money to asset managers for the purpose of management of it at scale. OK, and this is because of lower fees. They don't have to do like the, the amount of stuff that asset may, at sovereign wealth, uh, sovereign wealth entities and pension entities have to do, such as pay pensioners, have pensioner benefits, et cetera, or uh, create government economic stuff going on to grow. the. They, they just they that's enough for them to do. So they outsource it a lot of time to asset managers. Asset managers are not asset owners. Wait, okay. So pension funds, big government pension funds, also the U.S., um, it would be the two California, in the U.S., it would be the two California funds, California Public Employees, and then CalSTRS, which is the teacher's fund. Those are the two biggest in the U.S. CalSTRS doesn't make the top 10 any longer. But otherwise, this is like your countries and places that typically have the largest pension funds. And this is correct, but the number is always hard to get perfectly because in, in a list because there's some dude that's going around reading the pension notes to try to get the answer. But that's about 60 trillion in assets just off of pensions. And then you've got about 10 or 15 or so off of sovereign wealth. The difference between a sovereign wealth fund and a pension fund is the sovereign wealth fund is basically fine to hold anything to maturity 
until such a time, as long as they can cover the things that they've already said they're going to cover. So a pension fund is okay up until the point where they can't pay the pensioners the benefits that they've told the pensioners are going to pay. Okay, what's that mean? So for the for the sovereign wealth guys, they might be doing something like paying for, um, you know, lunch at schools or something like that. They might be paying for a bridge, something like that, or paying for the maintenance of a bridge. They get into trouble if they can't pay that. But thus far, there have been no big sovereign wealth issues. With the pension funds, a bunch of them got in trouble in 2008 because it just so happened that their pension liability is still 6 to seven, six to 8%, depending on what country, what location, what have you. So the pension funds can only hold to maturity so long as they don't have an issue paying a pension. OK, and that's that's when the wheels fall off is when it hits the pensions because we can't have it fall off. And so the other day I talked to this a little bit, with, but I want to continue to drill it home for people that watch me. This is what it looked like for the U.S. state pensions. We got corporate pensions. We got international pensions. It's just the state pensions. But you can see that Equable.org, which does a great job on the research front here. Uh, at least I don't have to make this chart. That makes me very happy. You can see the drop off was 94 percent funded to 63 percent funded during 2007, 2008, 2009. That's what caused the Great Recession and the deflation that then happened or sorry, the the uh, deliquification of the marketplace. That's what we don't want ever. OK, <laughs> again, because that sucked. That has taken almost a decade to get out of. All right. So that's that. Now. Everybody is really um, aggressive about the hedge funds. They're actually the third largest pool of assets, the set, or the fourth largest pool of assets. They're not even the third largest. The largest is going to be your pension funds as a big, gigantic pool, then your sovereign wealth, which the top 100 are going to be about the same size, and then it tails off really aggressively because there aren't that many sovereign wealth funds. And then you have this other part in the middle, which is the asset managers, and then you have the hedge funds. But let me just show you really quickly how big the asset managers are. Here's the asset managers. These are your top 10 global asset managers. You can see most of them are in the United States of America. And then you've got now UBS at 4.3 billion hanging out in Switzerland. So this is fairly recent. I will say that it, again, very hard to get the right number from any given list. No one ever puts, like sometimes people give you a timestamp, sometimes people do not. But I will say this, um, BlackRock is probably closer to 8.9 billion at, as of the fourth quarter. So if they increase or decrease, it's hard to say to give you a sense for how far off these numbers are. Even the, these are two different places that I got the numbers, um, but you can kind of see how it lays out, which is kind of important. So BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity, uh, and then you start to go overseas. But the U.S. owns the asset management business thus far globally for market share. So it 100 percent is the case that those European pensions, those Middle Eastern pensions are probably giving money to BlackRock as well as just a part of doing business. Now, these asset managers on this list they are still primarily in what we call liquid, maybe you might call them semi-liquid assets, meaning this is going to be debt markets and equity markets. And, uh, you know, I've shown before, just so you can kind of see it, what the allocation would look like. But somehow I managed to miss that slide here. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I'll have to pull it in from another uh, thing at the end. But the allocation to alternatives, which is a totally different type of asset, it's grown from 10 to 35 percent. And I've talked about this before. Part of the reason I believe this is happening is because, one, number one, alternatives are a very particular type of risk that allows you to not be in a certain type of trouble as a pension fund, as a sovereign wealth fund. Number one, the risk that you're taking is, is, is such that the returns can be much better. But number two, you don't have to take your mark at all <laughs> until the end of that situation happening. Because if it's a building, then it's really hard to mark the building. And we're going to get back to that in just a second because there was some news on Black, Blackstone that every, the market is reporting in this crazy way that I think is very unfair. OK, but because of the nature of what you're investing in, a toll booth, OK, a uh, building, a hospital, um, some kind of infrastructure project, like, you know, whatever it is, because of the nature of it, you don't take your mark quite the same way because there's no the mark isn't coming from the marketplace. The mark is coming from something else. All right. 
So as a function of that, your liquidity profile is very different. And what it means to have to take liquidity on that is very different, which is why I take real, real, that's part of the reason why I'm doing this, because some of the articles coming out on private equity are cuckoo. All right, moving on. Um, okay, did that. All right, sorry, sorry. All right, the last thing I want to go through. So, so flipping through here. Okay, so this is your asset managers. As you can see, Capital Group, still a very large asset manager is 2.7 trillion. Now let's go to the size of the hedge funds that everybody's so excited about. The total, this is an estimate, which I think is from 2021 from global, from uh, Eureka Hedge. Okay, Eureka Hedge has gotten, I think, I think they might've been bought out. I'm not sure if you know, put it in the comments. But um, anyways, Eureka Hedge, which I, I just grabbed from the internet, suggested there's about $2.3 billion in total assets. You can see that on the right here. And even though everybody's all focused on Citadel, which uh, is is at 2021, um, is $53 billion in assets. Now I'm seeing some quotes say they're at $62 billion. They're half the size of the actual largest hedge fund. It was always a shock to me that everybody's so excited about Citadel. Now, it may be because Citadel does a lot more market maker behavior than Bridgewater and Man Group and Renaissance. Renaissance does, I mean... Depends how you think of market maker. If you think of market maker as the pure function of market maker, then yeah. But if you think of, am I putting bid asks and trying to make scalp money off of quotes, then I mean, technically Renaissance is going to do that too. To be fair, I don't know as much about man group. Anyways, the point is, is that Citadel is not even the biggest one. Millennium is way bigger. Or Actually, Millennium here is at fifth, is bigger and probably they've grown approximately the size. I mean, Millennium's a big company as far as that goes. So I wouldn't be surprised if they've also managed to raise $6 billion in assets from 2001. Wouldn't shock me. Um, you know, and then so on and so forth, okay? So this is the size of it. As you can see, they're a fraction of the size of the other asset managers, but the type of behaviors and the type of investments that they do is fairly significant. And then none of the private equity firms are quite as large as this. Blackstone comes in. Um, it was really hard to find anything to help you all out to see what the size of private equity is. The other day, I went through the 10Ks and I saw that Blackstone's assets and our management is just under a trillion. And then KKR and um, and um, Apollo Group were both showing about half a trillion dollars in assets. But for whatever reason, when I look at literally any other Google search, it suggests that it's a lot smaller. So um yeah, so so it is the case that the private equity division can be a lot bigger depending on how you look at it. The challenge with looking at it that way is the nature of the assets, which a lot of that is real estate assets, et cetera. So it's um it's kind of its own thing. Anyways, I wanted you to kind of see this money flow because um let me see if I got anything. These are from the other day. Ah, yes. Okay, so the before I get into the last little thing I want to show, the key thing to kind of understand is that. The banks, they because the liability, the capital is coming from deposits for the most part for a bank, because the capital is coming from deposits, the thing that does them under is actually a run on a bank. Every day of the week, they will not be able to withstand from a capital perspective run on a bank. Um, if I go backwards a little bit, the insurance companies, the thing that does them under is this ratio called the combined ratio. And that's going to be from failing to, to uh, correctly assess the risk of the insurance policies they wrote and also not being able to get the risk off of the balance sheet. So in the insurance companies, if I wrote you uh, a bunch of policies along the coast in Florida, a hurricane comes through and I did the math incorrectly, I did the math incorrectly and that will eat away at my capital base. And I am really, really in trouble because the only way I can get rid of some of that risk for future policies in some cases, so it is to basically sell it to a reinsurer, okay? That's the way you get rid of risk um, in, in the insurance. And then there's other things that you also have to do. That's why Lincoln Financial is, is, is having a problem right this minute, Lincoln Financial being ins a life insurer. Okay. Um, the In contrast, and then let's see, the other things I went through, okay, um, a pension fund has pension liability I already went through. Sovereign wealth fund I went through. And then the last guys that I didn't go through would really be Google, all of those guys, okay? And those guys all had to take big write downs. And the way that they end up having a problem is if they are if they take their venture piece, their little companies, and they make them public, 
And then the thing is volatile like crazy. And then they got to take a write down on that. But typically all the other stuff that you know about assessing a stock or a business, that's going to happen. So like, for example, Amazon had to take a big write down on Rivian, even though they wrote it up two years prior when Rivian went public. So that's the kind of flowing one way or the other. And then depending on who, how Google, Amazon, Visa, MasterCard, Pfizer, all these big guys, how they feel about it, they may reduce the amount of capital for that kind of behavior and activity. Depends on what their deal is. So the way they make decisions, the way they end up moving the space is very different. Each one of them has got a different decision-making thought process. And depending on that process, that will liquidate or reduce the liquidity in the marketplace. Okay, last I have that hopefully is helpful one way or the other. Okay, again, the biggest asset managers, ah, yeah, okay. So I talked through how each one of them then is forced to go to into liquidation. But I do want to remind everybody, hopefully this is very, very, um, hopefully this is very, very uh, easy to see or as you get a chance to let it go into your mind a little bit. But the biggest asset managers are the ones that fuel all of this. And then I should have put companies in here, too, because the companies for, for very specific markets will feel all of this. But just to give you a simplified diagram of how it looks, don't worry about my arrows because I should have drawn them both ways. I can tell now, now that I'm describing it out loud. But you go to apply for a loan. This is on the debt side, OK, because this is what we're really watching right now. Everybody, everybody withheld to maturity. So let me let me back up a second. So the, the thing that I've noticed is written very strangely is everybody's looking at whether the loans were written properly, whether there's what have you, that's really credit risk. And then there's a set of people that are looking at duration risk. And I'm like, hey, friends, let's not ignore liquidity risk, because when liquidity risk gets crazy, the price action in the banks can you can you I mean, the collapse of a bank happens very quickly. It doesn't happen, doesn't happen, doesn't happen. Then you're scared and then it just go the wheels fall off. You know, the minute you're scared, the problem of the wheels falling off, it's like a joint it's like um, once you're scared, you need to get your money out of that bank because the probability goes up astronomically. So let's talk about what are the piece, what are the things that I'm looking for that made me concerned in December that you might have a liquidity issue, even though I didn't position myself as aggressively as I should have on this topic. Okay, when you go to write a loan, it usually moves in this direction. When you go to write a loan, there's an originator. OK, the originator is the person that you turned all the forms into. And there are pure play originators, which is what Opstart was. And I've been monitoring that on behalf of some people that have requested it. A pure play originator, their biggest job is to get the loan off the balance sheet. That's their whole that's half their job. One part of their job is to get really good people that need loans that people are happy to give money to. The other half is get the money off the balance sheet, get those loans off balance sheet. And what they will do to get the loans off balance sheet is they'll go to a set of investors. Those investors can be a bank. It can be a private individual. It could be a private organization like a family office that specifically specializes in that. Maybe if it's mortgages or something like that. Some people do specialize in specifically being the investor side of auto loans. CACC is the ticker of a company that does that. OK, they might go to an asset manager that directly invests in one off bespoke loans. It's very unique. That would be a very unique asset manager, but they exist. Or they might just put the money in a trust. OK, the trust is usually sponsored by or created by a big investment bank. And what the purpose of that trust is, is essentially the securitized process itself. OK, so that so when you read through the documents, they're talking about securitized loans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is where they're going with it. OK, the actual vehicle that does it is a trust and it sits there like a champ. And sometimes it's on balance sheets, sometimes it's off balance sheet. Now, turns out if you're a bank, and you got a bunch of loans that you're keeping on your balance sheet. You gonna do the same thing. You're going to try to get that stuff off balance sheet by pushing it off. And one of two things is going to happen. Either some other person is going to buy those assets, no problem, happy to do it, right? Or they're not, okay? And the minute they don't do it, that's when the credit market seizes up. Now, um, the big asset managers will also buy that because they're looking for a little yield, they're trying to do something. So they're happy to buy it off the asset managers or what have you, or they might outright have trusts existing that just like roll them in. But usually because of the size, the sheer raw size of what they're trying to do, someone is doing that on their behalf. 
BlackRock will be doing it on your behalf to provide financing to a company at a certain rate. And, and so this is kind of important to understand because when you're trying to read the financials of a lot of these finance companies, this is the missing piece of what people are missing among many missing pieces. Okay. So what I saw in December that disturbed me was that this group right here, these folks right here, the originators, they were not able to get stuff off balance sheet. So they, they're they held to maturity portion of their book, which shows on the cash flow statement and eventually moves to the balance sheet in a particular way. That was getting bigger and bigger. With respect to Upstart, who had not been holding hardly any of this, it went from like just under $3 billion in the first quarter of last year, which would have been reported about this time last year, to half a billion to three quarters of a billion. Now they're at a billion uh, as of the fourth quarter and so on and so forth. OK, what we really want to not see happen. OK, so number one, they are definitely demonstrating that all this talk, people still confused. The credit market has started to close down. The credit market has been closing down for a while. Otherwise, the originators would have been able to get the loans off balance sheet. But what we're looking for is how far back is the spigot being turned off? Is it still is it turned off at the investor level? Kind of, yeah, because that's why your originator is not able to get stuff off balance sheet. And so when we go to look at the banks this this quarter, we're going to be looking for the we're going to look at the cash flow statement. We're going to look at what how big is held to maturity increased in size, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we're going to kind of investigate there. The bigger asset managers, have they started to turn it off for the investors? We're also going to be watching for that. Now, the bigger asset managers don't say very much. So you're not going to get very much off of it. The only peekaboo you're going to get of the bigger asset managers is from the investment banks telling you some stuff and from the bigger banks like a JP Morgan, big diversified bank that also is attached to an investment bank telling you stuff. And then maybe the insurance companies telling you stuff. OK, um, so that is kind of the flow of how funding goes. And with that, I'll kind of pause. I know that's a lot. I don't know if there's actually questions to this or if this is just kind of a, a bit of a lecture of it. Um, oh, no. Was this true? Was my screen blank the entire time? Oh, no. Please write in. I'm going to feel so sad if it was. I'm going to have to watch this. Oh, no. All right. Oh, my gosh. All right, I might have to refilm this. Oh no, thank you guys for being here regardless. Okay, all right. Well, thank you guys for showing. I'll give shout outs to Care Bear. Um, really appreciate you stopping by. I know how busy your days are. James Harris, as always, thank you. Nova Kane, um, glad. Oh, okay, so you were able to see it again. That's awesome. Uh, Sean Alexander, thank you, thank you for stopping by. I appreciate you, uh, collab. Trendboard one, thank you for stopping by. Um, and I think I think I got everybody. Th thank you guys. Juicy got you crazy. You always crazy. I love you stopping by. And that's really it for today. Um, put in the comments if you have questions. That always helps me figure out what to go next. Hopefully that helps you see the space a little bit better. And Happy holidays to those that celebrate and happy vacation for those that are just going to tag along and take the day off anyways. 